finds a place to put this. All right, so. Oh, okay, good. All right, so uh, I'm gonna, since I'm day three, uh, I've, I've sort of modified a few things. So uh, maybe like the first uh, talk we had, the uh, title isn't as appropriate to uh, what we're gonna talk about here, but it's generally good. Uh, now, if, if, if you've all been watching any of the local TV in your rooms, you've seen an awful lot of political ads. Uh, and is, but I heard a couple of things that caught my ear. One of them was a public service announcement. Right? Those are the kind of things we put out when there's a storm coming, right? Uh, let the public know what's going on. It's essentially a public service announcement. And it's about uh, uh, store your marijuana in a place where your kids can't get it. Uh, you know, okay. Makes sense. Uh, and at the end of that uh, commercial, uh, a, a woman, the mom, is walking off the screen. And in the background, her kid says, hey, mom, I want you to do something. And she goes, oh, whatever. <laughs> and, and it struck me kind of funny. First of all, I never thought I'd heard of marijuana commercial on TV. Uh, but that's the same kind of attitude that the public takes a lot of times with, uh, you know, with this information we're trying to give them, they're either overloaded or uh, we've talked about this on a number of occasions about the false positives. Oh yeah, last time they said it was gonna, no, it didn't. Uh, but the other one that caught my ear was an Allstate commercial. And I haven't seen this one in Louisiana either. Uh, the guy says, uh, a 500 year storm comes every 500 years, right? And then he says, in the last decade, we've had 26 500 year storms. So, but again, I don't think the public gets that either. So I don't know how we communicate some of this stuff. All right, is this working? This one here? Okay, good, all right, sorry. Ah, okay. All right, good. All right, you know, it's, there's forward, there's back, there's forward. Got it. All right, so uh, I, I thought I'd start by just talking, well, what, so what is a uh, risk, right? A, a risk is expected loss. And, uh, you know, statistically, you can calculate this, the top equation is the way a frequent statistic, statistician would calculate it. You have some decision rule, and that determines the difference between an observation and your decision point. Uh, and you uh, take the expectation over your data and, uh, and pick the optimal, the, the thing that minimizes your error or loss. In a, in a Bayesian format, you do the same kind of thing, only you have a prior. And I think in our, in our case, an interesting thing here is that prior could be like satellite data that's constantly monitoring uh, the seasonal, monthly, whatever time step you want to look at, uh, whatever the hydrologic parameter is. It might be soil moisture, it might be precipitation, it might be potential evapotranspiration. There's a lot of these things that are available from satellite platforms. Uh, so that's your prior, and then you have some data that's sampled now, and you can update the prior uh, and come up with a posterior distribution. And in the Bayesian framework, you have a loss function that you integrate over the parameters of that posterior distribution and you pick the uh, optimal action. Now, uh, one of the interesting things, and we kind of did this uh, the other day uh, in, our, in our little dice experiment, right? Loss function counts, right? If your loss function is a squared error loss, like ordinary least squares, the least squares kind of paradigm that many statistical parameters are uh, sampled over, then the optimal decision is going to be made at the mean of the data or the posterior distribution. Uh, if, if your loss function is linear, uh, then it's at the median. And so why is that important? Well, you know, a lot of hydrologic things aren't like nice normal distributions where the mean and the median are the same place. And you've got large tails, you might want to be looking at the median uh, of, uh, 
of the response, which gives you a sort of, okay, 50% of the time I'm going to be below this, 50% of the time I'm going to be above it, and sort of frame your decisions and actions based on that. The loss function we had the other day, by the way, was an asymmetric loss function, right? If you incurred a flood, it cost you four beans. If you didn't incur a flood, it didn't cost you anything. So uh, you can actually work through the calculus of all this stuff and figure out what the optimal action to take uh, on any one annual throw. In fact, you could even work in the nine-sided dice thing uh, in that 10, uh, per 10 period of 10 years uh, and figure out what the optimal thing is to do every time. Uh, so the, guy, the point is the guys in the back just got lucky. Uh, you know, lucky beats... Uh, whatever, every time, I guess. So all this is models, right? So what's a model? And a model is an abstraction of reality, right? We, we like to think our model like captures reality, but we do our best. Uh, so you, you create this model to sort of uh, understand how things work and to capture the essence of what it, whatever it is that you're modeling. Um, and, you know, the better you are, the, the more credit you get for doing it right. Uh, but another important part about models, and we've talked a lot about this over the last few days, is that model has to be in the uh, context of some decision support role. So, you know, that model has to deliver me information that I can use to take my action, uh, and determine what I'm going to do. And that, you know, that, that's, if you, otherwise it's just a model, right? So uh, models are important to decisions. It has to give me things in the right time steps. It's got to give me things in the right spatial resolution and, and those kind of parameters. Uh, and again, it costs, in our case, it implies a spatial domain. So we're talking about a watershed. We're talking about a basin someplace or a coastline or a lake. Whatever we're trying to model a flood risk in has a spatial kind of domain implied to it. We don't care about the things that don't drain in there, just the things that do. Um, and then, of course, the, the time element is important. So, you know, do I, do I need this information? Well, first of all, the data that I'm putting in my model, right, how, do, how is that provided to me? Is that an annual number, a monthly number, a, a daily, an hourly, every 15 minutes, whatever? Models operate at all these, or data is delivered in all these different scales. Then the models operate in whatever scale they operate in. It could be any of those. And then the information that comes out of them has to be in a scale that provides me in the time frame that I need uh, uh, that information. So here's just sort of the generic model. Uh, you know, you have Q, the output. Uh, you have the model itself, which is this F thing. Uh, the, you've got uh, an X, Y, Z, in this case, representing sort of maybe the characteristics of the basin, maybe the spatial extent, uh, the soils, whatever it is that are important in your hydrologic model. T, the time thing again, you know, is this, is this is a daily time step? Is it uh, an annual time step monthly? What's important for making my decisions? The part that gets left out a lot of times is, uh, is the thing on the end, because we focus on the model itself, and the error is just like this nuisance thing that we just kind of want to ignore. So, you know, we know our model isn't perfect, but it's okay. But that nuisance thing is comprised of a couple of different components. The error term uh, encompasses the things we don't know, the things that our model doesn't account for in uh, providing the output. Uh, but uh, it also includes sort of intrinsic variability uh, in that system. So, for example, here, I've got three simple models. Uh, let's just say uh, the flow on the y-axis is a function of the area of the watershed. Okay, we can kind of all agree that that's kind of an increasing function. Bigger watersheds have bigger runoff, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you can take three watersheds that have exactly the same area, right, on the x-axis, uh, but they're comprised of different things. They have different combinations of soils. They have different slope regimes. Uh, by the way, different slope regimes, this is something that I think is fascinating. We do a lot of watershed modeling based on the area of the watershed. Well, you throw a slope in there. If you have a lot of slope in that watershed, then the actual surface area in that watershed uh, is higher. 
So we, we never account for that. Uh, and, and, and maybe that's an important factor in our modeling. So in this case, we've got three relatively identical watersheds, but their intrinsic variability is different because of how they're composed, at least with respect to the relationship between runoff and, uh, uh, and, and area. So in, in the upper left, you've got a relatively uh, low, low error, you've got a pretty good model. It's, you can see the line there. Uh, the regression line in the second one is in the same place, but the stuff scattered around a little bit more. So we need to understand, and of course in the third case, eventually if your model doesn't uh, do very well, the variability can overwhelm it, you need a new model. So let's talk about geospatial models, and geospatial models are important in the context of what we've been talking about all week, uh, because uh, they're, they're the way we're going to get the things we need, to, the data we need to answer our questions, to run our models, whatever. And, and you, you know, we, we've uh, sort of implied a lot of this stuff. The, the geospatial model is uh, something that the model elements are spatial objects. And those spatial objects can take advantage of uh, geographic information systems, uh, concepts, and data, and technology. And the most important things here are uh, the relationship between these objects, the spatial relationship. So the juxtaposition of, uh, of elements you know, what, what's next to what, uh, uh, what overlaps what, okay? And that's really important because when we're talking about data and, you know, uh, remote sensing guys understand this, right? You got things that give you data at 30 meters, things that give you data at 10 meters, things that give you data at one meter. Uh, so uh, you're always dealing with different scales of information. And in the geographic information system, geospatial kind of format, you can combine that information because you can handle juxtaposition. So what overlaps what is known. What doesn't overlap what, for that matter, then, is also known. And then topology. Uh, that's another really important thing, right? I don't care what happens in the next basin over, but I do worry about what's upstream from me. So connecting upstream and downstream, that's what you know, topology is all about. So, uh, so kind of two kinds of basic ways that things flood. Uh, you got rising water uh, that just kind of inundates stuff and uh, it, it causes uh, chemical reactions and whatever. It, it, it causes infrastructure to uh, have problems. If you flood a road for a couple of days, it's pretty well known that the foundation of that road is going to deteriorate over time. So that road's going to start buckling and cracking. And uh, so, for example, in Katrina, we made sure we knew where every flooded road was. And, uh, and, and we're able to put together our uh, damage assessments and uh, talk to the, the FEMA people and the government about that. So, uh, so that's one kind of damage. And that comes from storm surge. Uh, we get a lot of backwater flooding in Louisiana. So uh, when the wind is blowing from the east to the west, across Lake Pontchartrain, the water level on the west end of the lake could be you know, four or five feet higher than the east end. And it, that pushes across that little isthmus, we'll see a few maps later, uh, that uh, separates it from Lake Maurepas. And, uh, and most of the things that drain into that basin come through Lake Maurepas. So all of those uh, basins, uh, all of those drainages that are going to Lake Maurepas now have higher water at the bottom. So the water that's coming down the drainage is backing up. And you can, you can get backwater flooding clear into Baton Rouge, which is you know, tens of miles away from there. Uh, so that, that's one of the, uh, one of the ways we, we flood things is, is this rising water kind of deal. And flowing water, that's a whole other deal, right? Now you got the force of the water in here. So you got you know, flash floods, tsunamis, uh, you, you've got riverine flooding. Uh, and I'll talk about this, I guess, a little bit later when we talk about the flood of 2016. But I remember, uh, you know, uh, my guys upstairs, hey, uh, we need to know what's going to flood in, in the Amy River. Can't do that without a model, right? You, you can do rising water flooding pretty easy. Uh, well, this is catching up here. So rising water flooding is fairly easy to do because the surface is well behaved. You know, it's got a little bit of play in it, but it, it comes up from the bottom of the watershed. But the, uh, the, the flowing 
riverine channel type flooding it has a slope to it. So I just can't say that if I got a gauge height up here, that everything that's, uh, that's below the elevation of that gauge height is going to flood because it's contained in the channel. So let's talk about, uh, about rising water flooding, specifically a storm surge. So actually on the right-hand side here, I've got a map of the, uh, of the slosh grid, right? The sea, lake, overland uh, surge from hurricanes. And by the way, they now include tropical storms. So maybe they need to call it slots or something now. Um, so that's a category zero storm when you, when you get the data. So uh, uh, you can see this, uh, this model starts way up in, in the uh, New England area, goes all the way down the coast. Actually, I chopped off Texas. Um, it needs Texas. Um, but um, uh, anyways, uh, in that uh, model grid, are all the bathymetry and land surfaces and obstructions and things. We actually went out, uh, by the way, the data that was available in that regard, particularly the landforms, even the bathymetry. Some of the bathymetry had in South Louisiana uh, was last collected in the 1800s. Uh, we, we've had, had a lot of, uh, uh, of sediment delivered into the coastal areas. So those are all, all gone. I think I mentioned something about this the other day about some of the lakes in the Piedmont. The lakes have all filled up from the bottom with sediment. So all of our flood models that are, that are thinking that's a nice sink to hold water, they don't have the capacity they used to have. Anyway, I digress. Um, so your, your uh, grid has all this stuff built into it. We even went out, by the way, and measured the elevations of those Jersey barriers going down the middle of the interstate. So, this, so the Hurricane Center guys could work that stuff into their models. This is a very important thing. All these little things. Uh, become barriers to storm surge either moving in or out for that matter uh, and uh, and the effect of timing and uh, ultimate water levels and all those kind of things I've also sort of included on the right hand side here some uh, some details the Chesapeake Bay South Carolina coastline North Carolina and the, and the New Orleans area so they do this slosh model thing and it's a geospatial model right uh, it it takes geospatial data it uh, has a geospatial framework within it, and it gives me data in a grid of polygons that tell me what the water level is going to be within that particular polygon. Uh, and it does that in actually several different products. It gives me a set of polygons for the 10% exceedance, 20, 30, 40, and 50% exceedance. So, so how do they get this, right? So uh, they take a storm and they run it into the coast. And when it hits the coast, it does all of the hydrologic uh, processes that, that affect storm surge. And, uh, and they do that a couple thousand times. And so the 10% exceedance is the 90th percentile of all of those outcomes. And then the 20 would be 80 and the 30. So the other, the other important one to me is the 50. So how do you interpret? Uh, what, what a 10% exceedance means, or how does the public do that? How do you interpret the 50%? Well, you know, 50% is pretty easy, right? There's a 50-50 chance this thing is going to happen. I can make a decision on that a lot easier than, well, there's a 10% chance it might be this deep, or a 90% chance, which is actually pretty good, that it's not going to be that deep. So, you know, that's, that's, that's an issue. So here's Hurricane Nate from last year. In fact, it was about a year ago. Uh, at this time that, that Nate was wandering around the, the Caribbean and the Gulf. Um, oh, and by the way, I, I noticed yesterday that uh, the Hurricane Center is watching something in the Western Caribbean right now that they're expecting to form somewhere, uh, maybe down uh, in the area between the Yucatan and Cuba. We got 30% on that one right now. So here we are looking at, uh, one of the things I look at uh, as I'm, collecting information, and this is a HuraVac, which is a decision support system. It's, right now it's on a, uh, uh, on a Windows platform. Uh, they're moving it all into the web now. But it'll be the same kinds of stuff. This is the wind swath uh, representation of Nate at this particular advisory. And you can see that Louisiana is sort of uh, at the edge of the tropical storm force winds, the, the blue stuff. Uh, but, you know, storm surge, it didn't follow those lines. You know, storm surge is this 
uh, what they like to call it a dome of water. It's being pushed by the winds. It's usually pretty heavy on the right-hand side of the storm. So we're in a good spot in that regard. And it's going to be, you know, Mississippi and Alabama that get, get the worst kind of storm surge from this. Another interesting thing, and I'm not sure how well it was modeled, <clears throat> but uh, uh, what was it? Maria? What, the storm that went up the middle of Florida. Uh, on the right-hand side of that storm, it was pushing water on shore and flooding things. On the left-hand side of the storm, it was pulling water away, and there were boats sitting on the bottom of the bay kind of stuff. Uh, and and that, that's not just like you're talking about the pleasure boats kind of stuff. The guys that are uh, trying to uh, run freighters in and out, they got to worry about uh, the depth of that channel so uh, they don't get grounded. So this is the grid I get. And, and so remember that big grid that goes from like Maine to Texas. I just clip out the part that's important in Louisiana. And uh, this is sort of, you can see kind of the extent of what I get. Um, it's uh, uh, it's kind of hard to show things, but you can see underneath uh, the landforms. You can see the places where there is no grid cell, which tells you they expect that to be dry. But in the top center of this, you're clear, clear up in Baton Rouge. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I-10 and 12 go across here. Uh, they come through Slidell on the, on the right-hand side of the map and run across to Baton Rouge, cross the Mississippi River, and go into Houston. Uh, that's, a, that's the major east-west uh, trucking route between the West Coast and the East Coast in, on, in the Southern tier, right? You've got to go up to I-20 before there's a next East-West, uh, and that, that goes across the top of the state. That's our alternate route. So now I got these cells, and they tell me what the water level is going to be uh, in that location. Uh, uh, and that's how I do my analysis. Uh, so let's talk about what the products are, though, because we talked yesterday about how in, uh, in, a, in a real storm event, I don't get operational forecast. So an operational forecast is a forecast that's based on the actual storm conditions, right? So they come out with an advisory every six hours, and that sets what the Hurricane Center thinks will be the direction, the forward speed, the uh, strength of the storm. Uh, and, and then those parameters are put into the model uh, and run. And uh, they're varied a little bit uh, to get the you know, sort of stochastic element of, uh, of the, all of those things. The, the storm track isn't going to be exactly where they said it was in two days. Uh, the strength might be a little bit more, a little bit less, uh, those kinds of things. So they, they run all these simulations, a couple thousand simulations, and then they, they deliver these grids to me. But in that three days, right, so, you know, most emergency management time frames start five days out. Uh, so at 120 hours. In those three days before that 48-hour first uh, actual operational forecast, I've got what's called moms and meows. By the way, I'll point out that for Katrina, uh, Tropical Depression 12 formed at 117 hours out. So we were already three hours behind our timeline, and it was just a tropical depression. It's just a tropical depression, not even a hurricane. Um, anyway, and the track, you know, it came across southern Florida, and it went up the west coast of Florida, and it stayed over there. That was Tuesday when it started, and it stayed over there till Thursday, and all of a sudden it jumped over to New Orleans. So you, you got to account for track uncertainty in these things. So let's talk about what the moms and meows are, because that's how you're making your decision. So uh, the meow is. Uh, a, again, a series of simulations uh, given a d storm direction, uh, a uh, storm uh, strength, forward speed, and tide. They, they use a mean tide and they use a, a high tide. And so they run thousands of those simulations. So you've got for every combination of those factors, uh, you've got a cell in the, in the model. And they, they cut the, to, to make this a little bit simpler, is they cut the that long, big model into basins. So there's a, for Louisiana, there's a, a New Orleans basin, which runs from Mississippi to almost all the way across the coast. Uh, there's a Vermilion basin, which is kind of the south central part, runs from maybe the east side of the Mississippi River uh, to about Texas. And then there's the Sabine basin, which kind of picks up in the middle of, of uh, Louisiana and runs into Texas. So that helps them reduce 
you know, the delivery issues for, if you did that for the entire, you know, coastal model, it would be, be huge. And people are not interested in anything but their own stuff, right? Anyway, so the, the, the meow is, I know the storm direction, I know the storm strength, I know how fast it's gonna be going, and I can get a better estimate than just a wild ass guess. Well, what they did then was they said, well, we may not know all these things, so let's take all of the meows and we'll stack them up, and we'll pick for each of the cells the, the worst, the worst case for a given category and tidal regime. So regardless, basically what we're saying here is regardless of storm direction, regardless of storm speed, the mom is a worst case scenario for uh, what we expect to happen. And that may be all you've got for a couple of days. You, in fact, uh, see if I can do this right. So this colored wind swath, uh, that's 72 hours. So you're not even gonna know a real storm direction or, uh, uh, or forward speed until 72 hours out. And that's still 24 hours before you're getting, gonna get an operational uh, forecast. So those are the moms and meows that you use for mitigation purposes maybe, for drills, uh, for working without perfect information, um, or maybe just informing the public you wanna get out of the way because this is what could happen. And then the operational forecast come out. And again, the operational forecast is the same model. They, they take the actual storm parameters, feed them in the model and calculate what the uh, actual uh, damage is going to be. So what I do then is I get that grid, and this is a little piece of uh, State Highway 23 down very near the bottom of the Birdfoot Delta. Uh, the end of the road is probably not too many miles south of here, which would be to the right. Um, and uh, I can subtract the water level elevation in that slosh cell. Uh, I can subtract from that the elevation of the road. So on a two-year annual cycle, biannual cycle, but on a two-year cycle, uh, we go out and we collect road inventory information. As, as part of that, we get a point every four millimiles. That's 21.12 feet. So we have a, a location and an elevation. We're using a real-time network a GPS to pull this down. Uh, the RTN guys tell, well, it's, it's like kind of golf ball accuracy, maybe softball for three dimensions. So we've got a pretty good idea what the road elevation is at these points. And, and then that gives us a basis to calculate the, uh, uh, the potential flood here. And uh, I don't know how well you can actually see it, but the, there are red dots on there, which are the, uh, the high end of flooding. Uh, it might be uh, feet, for example. Um, the lighter dots may be something, I think I put these in quarter uh, foot increments. So the lighter dots are, are slightly flooded kind of areas. The black dots, by the way, are places that don't show up as a flood. So the storm surge elevation was below the, uh, the road elevation at those points. And the top map is the 10% exceedance slosh. The bottom map is the 50% uh, exceedance. So you got a 50-50 chance of seeing this. You got a 10% chance of seeing this other one. Um, and a couple, couple interesting things. Uh, I finally figured this out last week, uh, talking to the road inventory guys. I kept looking at, I kept getting values that had like minus 40. There's no place in Louisiana that's 40 feet below sea level. And there's things that are maybe 20 feet. But I realized <clears throat> I actually have three tunnels and those are tunnel road elevations. We got a tunnel underneath the Mississippi River south of Louisiana, one just upstream and one over in Homa. And I, I just thought those were errors in the data. <clears throat> so now I can start telling people, well, we got we to close it. It doesn't matter, by the way, uh, where it floods on this road. If it floods anywhere, we can't get pat people through it, right? Oh, and what is a flood? So a flood is, or, or a, a road closure criteria, our decision rule, three inches, right? Three inches, and you start getting more than that, and cars start going off the road, and you have other problem with, with getting traffic through. Another really interesting thing is that... Uh, Slosh now includes tide, but it doesn't include wave action, all right? So, <clears throat> you know, wave action, what, what kind of wave action do you think you get with, with, with a storm? Three inches, six inches, a foot? So it, it really means almost any flooding is gonna be 
uh, closing that road when you throw the wave action thing in. By the way, there's a, there's a huge area for research on that topic. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's what I'm looking at, you know, at, at the detail level. This is a, the same data uh, on the left, 10 at the top, 50 at the bottom, uh, with, uh, uh, with our District 02, the entire district, which is our Southeast Louisiana uh, group. On the right-hand side is Burris. My sample came from up on the uh, right-hand side of that. So this is kind of the local community. Burris during Katrina uh, was a, uh, an urban cluster in, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Census data. It, that was, what, 2005? In 2010, it wasn't anymore. I mean, it just wiped through there and took things out. I drove through that area uh, in uh, maybe October of 2005, and there were trucks up in trees and boats and houses in the middle of the road. You had to go around them out in the field someplace. It was pretty amazing to see you know, what happened from the storm surge. Um, all right, so what are some of the issues? Timing is a real big issue. So I know how high it's going to flood in this six hour window, right? But I don't know when that's gonna happen. And, and you know, two, three, four, five hours of lead time on uh, when I ha have to close a road and an evacuation route in particular, you know, could be very important. This, uh, you know, this is just, it's just not in the data. Uh, it's not available. Um, <clears throat> so, so timing uh, is, is an issue. Again, the, the, the forecast comes out uh, every six hours from the hurricane center. And uh, then the storm surge guys start working on that forecast, and in about an hour, they deliver the slosh products. So there's a little, there's a little lag in that. Um, there are some other issues with the data. So, you know, uh, the way they communicate the data to the public. So when you're listening to the Weather Channel or your local weather guys, they're all reading the same data, by the way, right, from, from the Weather Service. Uh, they may employ some commercial models, too, who knows. Uh, but they're looking at all this stuff, and, and what they're being told is uh, there's, this, there's this above ground thing, okay? So the Hurricane Center decided a few years ago that people don't understand uh, uh, storm surge flooding from water levels, right? Um, and, but they would uh, understand above ground level. Well, the, pr the problem with above ground level is uh, you're reporting depth, okay? So... Uh, the water surface is fairly well behaved over a fairly large area. These cells could be, you know, thousands of meters. <clears throat> but the land underneath them have a lot of terrain, right? The second derivative of elevation underneath them is fairly high. And uh, that causes in these AGL, above ground level numbers, uh, a situation where if you're in a local high spot, it ov way overestimates your risk. If you're in a local low spot, it way underestimates your risk. So you still got to know where you are sort of in a relative sense in whatever grid cell you're in, which you know, the public doesn't know that. Um, the public can know, by the way, and a lot of them in Louisiana do, you know, what their base flood elevation is, what, the, what their slab elevation, what their house elevation is. So giving them elevation, in my opinion, is more useful. And, and it's, in, in my case, I can't use a depth. There's no way to back out the water level elevation and, and run it against my my road points. So I pull, I, I pull down the uh, the water level elevation directly, and and I use that. Uh, an, another issue I think is this concept of uh, of ten percent exceedance. I, I don't I don't know how the public really interprets that. You know, it it really does mean that ninety percent of their simulations were below that, and and uh, that's you know, how does the public understand that? Now, 50-50, uh, and, and I talked to our engineers about this when, when, uh, when we decided how we're going to use these data. And I said, well, you know, let's look at the 50-50 because, uh, you know, depending on your loss function and depending on your risk aversion and whatever kind of stuff, if there's a 50-50 chance that this thing is going to be at this level, then people understand making that decision. And the engineers kind of got that. And we, we look at both. Uh, the The... Hurricane Center guys call that 90%, the 10% exceedance value, maximum regret. <clears throat> and, and their interest is in trying to get people to be motivated to evacuate. So they want to give them, you know, a high value. I, I understand that. <clears throat> but these are just some of the issues that happen with the, with the storm surge data. 
So let's talk about the flood of 2016. And you know, I'll uh, apologize for not really getting uh, what I would have liked to with this, but this is the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. It's got this kind of cone head top uh, over on the northwest side. It's bordered on the west by the Mississippi River. Okay, so the Mississippi River levee starts in Baton Rouge and goes all the way to the south. From Baton Rouge north, there's a, uh, there's a bluff actually. That, uh, everything in this diagram from the Mississippi River flows to the east and into Lake Marapar, Lake Pontchartrain, and then out to the Gulf. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. The, uh, we're looking at hydrologic unit code level 12 uh, basin delineations, local watersheds. They're called sub-watersheds. <clears throat> and in those uh, sub-watersheds, the Huck system is kind of a hierarchy of things. So you belong to a, each of these belong to uh, a watershed, which belongs to a sub-basin, which belongs to a basin, which belongs to a sub-region, belongs to a region. So the region here actually starts at the Mississippi River and I think goes all the way to Virginia or something. That's the south region. <clears throat> the region on the other side of the Mississippi River goes all the way to Mexico. That's the Texas Gulf uh, region. And the rest of you guys, the 42% of the United States that is upstream from Louisiana, that just comes down between those two little levees. And you pretty much keep them in there. There's no interaction. Uh, actually, they're trying to use Mississippi water uh, through coastal uh, restoration processes. They'll siphon out water with sediment in it and try to re-nourish the marsh with it. But that little, little thin piece of thing between the levees really doesn't interact at all with the local hydrology. So let's, let's talk about this, uh, this watershed. So Baton Rouge is kind of over here on, on the left-hand side in the middle. Uh, I-10 and I-12 kind of come across the middle of this thing. Uh, uh, they built I-10 and I-12 mostly to stay way above uh, like coastal flooding elevations. Although because interstates were required to go through major cities, they had to dip I-10 down into New Orleans and back up. Most of I-10 is actually on a bridge in the New Orleans area. Now, hardly anything's that grade. The ones that are get flooded. So this is the basic hydrologic layout. You really can't see what's going on here very well. So let's go to the next slide. So in this slide, I've uh, gone to the next level up in the hydrologic units, uh, uh, the Huck 10 level. Okay, so each of these Huck 12 uh, sub-watersheds are now colored by the watershed that they belong to. And you can kind of see here now that there's a, there's a sort of a drainage pattern on the far left side, and we kind of stripe our way down <clears throat> uh, through that sort of conical upper part of the watershed uh, in, in a north-south sort of fashion. And then we start at some point moving to the east. And this is part of what caused the, uh, the flood. Okay. The, 2016 flood, I don't know how many people said, oh, it never flooded here. We, we, well, I've lived here for 50 years and we never had a flood. Uh, we, we lost something like you know, 60,000 vehicles because people saw water in their yards. By the time they got the stuff together, the car was flooded and they couldn't get out. <clears throat> it, 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 it was a fast moving uh, flood. It, it came from all directions. Uh, one of the most amazing things is on one of these basin boundaries, one of my friends lives uh, right, right below, the, the road that he lives on is on the ridge between two, two basins, it's down towards the Amy River. And his house got flooded downhill. I don't think of flooding coming like that, right? It came over the top of the basin boundary, just north of him. <clears throat> his house sits maybe six or eight feet below the road level. And it, it cascaded, he had white water coming over the edge of that, uh, into his house, and, uh, and of course, now he's got, <clears throat> now he's got flowing type uh, damage. So anyway, so, uh, and, and this is the sort of geospatial thing. It's like the arrangement of these things is important. So what, what happened with the inputs? The inputs were like 35 inches of rain overnight kind of stuff. We can't even, we can't even design for a storm that's that big. You couldn't afford to build the highway high enough or the building strong enough or whatever. Um, but what happened is over, over here on the right-hand side in, uh, in the Big Bend area of Florida, there was a low-pressure system that kind of wandered around the Gulf. Never got a name. It wasn't 
strong enough to get, become a tropical storm or even a depression. Uh, and then it just kind of sat over there. And my original thought, uh, and this is again where the spatial and temporal stuff comes in. My original thought was, when I look at the rainfall patterns on this, what I'm gonna see is this, circ this counterclockwise circulation centered around that low that's off sitting over Alabama and just constantly whacking us. <clears throat> There's a really cool site at uh, the university, uh, I guess it's Iowa State University, where you can download uh, historical data rainfall in five minute time increments. And then again, we're gonna talk now here about some time things. So what I found when I started animating the rainfall across this basin is the rainfall actually pretty much came in from the Northwest and across to the Southeast. And so it's, uh, because it was so big, it was filling up, you know, the entire watershed simultaneously. But remember this drainage pattern. The drainage pattern is these sort of north-south troughs that contain the water within their boundaries until they got down to where they made a left turn to the east uh, and uh, met the backwater flooding coming out of the Amit River and stacked up and then went over the lip of the basin. We just don't see that kind of flooding. I mean, that's just, it was very, very, very odd. The other thing that I thought was really important when I started looking at the uh, precipitation animations was a time step. So if I, if I did an hourly time step, I saw one thing, but if I cranked that baby up and looked at what happened every five minutes, what I was seeing were these big red things that popped up and maybe only lasted for five or 10 minutes. But those things were raining at just incredible intensities. I went to work on Friday morning, uh, which would have been, I think, the 12th of August, and I almost got flooded out getting to work uh, in downtown Baton Rouge. Uh, uh, they, they eventually told us, don't come to work. Well, you know, when you start at 6.30, you're at work for everybody else is to make that decision, I guess. Uh, so I got a call that evening from the Secretary of the Department of Transportation saying, the Weather Service wants to know how high the bridges are on the Amy River and the major rivers on I-12 uh, that come from Slidell. Uh, it's kind of a shortcut, so you don't have to go down to New Orleans on the interstate system. Because uh, th they think that those things are going to flood. So I got out my road points. And now that's the, that's the, uh, that's the elevation of the, road, the bridge deck. So I had to find an engineer that could tell me, you know, what's the bottom? Yeah, take about six feet off of those, and that'll be the bottom of the bridge. Well, there's a gauge right upstream on the Amit River from where I-12 crosses. <clears throat> that gauge, I think, got up to 46 feet. The bridge, the bottom of the bridge was 29 feet. Okay, but remember, we're talking about a riverine flood. That bridge never flooded. And uh, the, the, the undersecretary, the decision maker people at DOT kept saying, uh, you need to do me an inundation map. I can't do an inundation map in a riverine flooding situation without a model. I have to contain that stuff within the basin boundary, and I have to know the elevations along the sides, and it's not just a 2D thing. So uh, uh, I guess I don't talk with those guys much anymore. Um, so here's a cool thing I did. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a product in... Uh, the ESRI suite of products called schematics. <clears throat> and I actually did this a number of years ago. Uh, the watershed boundary data set tells you what watershed you flow into. So I can build this flow network. And I can actually visualize things this way that you can't by looking at, you know, this kind of a representation. And certainly not over here, right? You can't tell what goes where. You can kind of get an idea this way. But when I build that schematic, that flow diagram, if you will, I can know where everything flows. In fact, it was amazing to me. I lived in you know, Baton Rouge for 20 years, and I didn't realize that almost all of the things that go into Lake Pontchartrain go through Lake Marlpaw first. Nice little settling basin. Um, uh, but you can also then create a schematic that's more of a, like an engineering diagram of this network. And you can see where these points are, uh, and I've correlated them between the geographic schematic on the map and the engineering diagram, let's call it, on the right, and uh, where those basic choke points are. And those are the kind of, we talked about visualization. These are maybe some of the tools that we could use to identify 
places that are going to be important uh, in a hydrologic uh, event like we had in uh, Louisiana. So time was a big issue. Uh, and again, just visualizing things, I didn't see the red spots like I saw. Uh, I didn't see them at, at one hour time steps like I saw them at five minute time steps. So, you know, we need to understand some of those concepts. So this is actually the diagram uh, in, a, in a little better, little bigger picture. So you can, uh, you know, for purposes of say flood routing or uh, maybe the local floodplain manager or something or other, you can get an idea. And of course, actually you can put the gauges so you can identify where gauges are along this network. One of the cool things on the network uh, is within the ArcGIS platform, you can actually uh, uh, trace things upstream and downstream. So it has the topology built into it. And I believe that is it. Thank you, Jim, for this uh, very nice and technical account somehow, but very important to link it to modeling and everything because there's a lot of stuff we just assume in our models, but we can't really test them in a context like this. So but, you know, I probably should have had a concluding slide that said, uh, and this occurred to me in one of the breakouts yesterday is, you know what, we've got a whole lot of hind casting we can do, right? We can go back to these different events uh, and look at the historical record and say, you know, doing an expected value of perfect information kind of analysis. If I'd have known at this point in time what it really did, other than what I knew before we got to that point in time, but I made a different decision. Yeah, that's and right. then talk about the things we need to make those decisions. I think you know something like this could be a, a, a use case, almost like a benchmark study to see with different models, do we get this right or not? I would be very surprised to see that we get this right, but we could learn a lot of lessons. You know, for instance, how is, you know, when you get this above ground elevation on the roads, you actually need to account also for maybe the red points are moving to the, to the black points, you know, and you can only do that as Jim pointed out with a 2D or 3D, I don't know, model. You know, another, uh, uh, in, in the GIS business, I've developed some concepts over the years. Mitchell's three rules of GIS. The first one is everything you know is wrong, right? And, 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 and that's because everything we do is a model, right? It's not reality. So we have to accept the fact that we've modeled reality and that there's some fuzz in there that we can't account for. So don't think of your uh, boundary lines, your grid, your soil polygons, all these things as being perfectly located because they're not. Don't even think about it. Are there any quick questions, like one or two, that we can take before Albert Break. Will introduce Greg? Oh, no, we get another one. No? Yes? Specifically for the storm surge? <clears throat> well, okay, you know, I, I'm monitoring gauges all the time. I put together some, uh, actually they're RCS online story maps that uh, you can look at current gauge information. Uh, so I'm looking at those where that comes in handy. We have had issues, and I think this is important to bring out because we've talked about the credibility of what the information we're trying to communicate. We've had some issues in past storms where like the LSU guys that run an ADSERC model, they, they want to get their model on the table and, and they want to, want to make decisions. Well, it turned out that their forecasts were really pretty bad. Uh, but, and you don't want people doing uh, unauthoritative forecasts and sending them out to the public. In this case, it was even worse because it was going to the governor and the emergency operations guys. And it, it just confuses them. And, and I think another thing is we talk about Storm surge, uh, you know, uh, expected flooding above normally dry land. You know, so, you know, so what does that mean? I think people would really rather hear a decision than a data point. Get, get out now because we think you're going to flood really bad. Rather than, oh, well, the water's going to be 10 feet. Uh. Coming back to the communication issue that was pointed out so many times. Yeah. During this. Any, any more questions? Yes, the last one. Yes.
Um, <clears throat> that's absolutely true. Keep in mind that uh, that NOAA does the the storm surge stuff and the USGS or the Weather Service, you know, does so there's some of those kind of issues. Uh, if you know anything about NOAA, it's a very compartmentalized thing, right? There's guys that do the track, there's guys that do the strength, there's the guys that do the whatever, and uh, and they're different people. And they kind of, I don't know, I have this vision that when they set an advisor out, they all kind of come together and say, well, let's do this, let's do this, this. But trying to deal with flooding coming out of the gauging system and uh, combining that with the uh, uh, with the storm surge, that's a real difficult problem. Nobody's figured it out. Thank you. Um, I think we better move on to keep it in time. So thank you, Jim. Albert, you want to? Um, our next